I was uh, going back this morning to do a little intellectual reading, and I was reading in this wonderful book by Rabbi Paul Drach, who is the author of one of the uh, prayers for the conversion of the Jews that we use, De l'harmonie entre l'église et la synagogue. And um, it's really neat. So that's what I thought I'd share with you. And he's got some very neat discoveries, so to speak, on the Jewish oral tradition and the Christological message in the entire um, spiritual side of the Jewish oral tradition. So I don't know exactly where to start. And maybe I won't start with reading. I uh, Basically, I'm drawing this from, as I said at the beginning of the show, this book written in the, mm, I'd say, 1860s or so. Anyway, it's by uh, convert Rabbi Paul Drock of the harmony between the church and the synagogue. So what on earth is this all about? You know about the phylacteries. You know about the... the um, the uh, little boxes that Jews have on their forehead when they pray. Front lips before your eyes. It comes from Deuteronomy. I will put a picture up in Israeli soldier with that phylactery to fill in here. It's in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6 verse 8. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be on your heart, and you shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. So that's the basis for the tefillin. They, they're taking it literally, that they're binding it as frontlets before their eyes, and Jewish men use it when they pray. Okay, now you may see, if I zoom in here, uh, the the how the frontlets, how the tefillin are made is very precisely defined in the Talmud. Uh, it has to be, the, the certain verses are written inside that little box. That little box is actually leather. It looks like wood, but it's leather that's treated in a certain way so that it holds its shape. And um, very precise uh, instructions on you know, the they verses have to be written on parchment. It has to be the skin of a kosher animal. <clears throat> it has to be written by a scribe in a certain way. Everything is very tightly defined. And among the other things that are tightly defined is on, on the outside of the box. Um, you'll see there, I'll zoom in here. There is the letter Shin, which is pronounced... Sh, sh, shalom starts with a shin. Uh, Shekinah starts with a shin. It's basically an SH sound. And um, normally they're written with three branches. And in fact, on the headpiece of the tefillin, the command in the Talmud is that on one side, it's written with four branches, which is not the normal way. And on the other side, it's written with three branches. And let me pull up a picture of that. There is a picture of the tefillin shot from the other side. So that's the three branch shin. And so the left side, if I have that right, is four branches and the right side is three branches. And this is specified in the Talmud. So here is basically the argument of drawing on centuries of scholarship, Catholic scholarship, and Jewish convert scholarship. And his basic premise is the following. Maybe I'll read. Maybe now I'll go to reading. Okay. Manasseh ben Israel cites an example of this difference. Now, his, his point is that, that the Jewish oral tradition has two dimensions to it, two sides to it. One side is the how do you follow the laws, and the other side is the underlying spiritual meaning of everything, the, the prophetic interpretation 
of everything you're supposed to do. And what has happened is that at the time, uh, around the time of Jesus, actually, and especially after the time of Jesus, when the Talmud was written down, the part of the oral tradition, which was the inner spiritual meaning of everything, was not preserved by the rabbis, and they only kept the external obedience, obeisance of the laws. And um, Drak goes on to discuss why they did this, and it had to do with the fact that the entire spiritual interpretation of the Old Testament within Judaism was Christology. It was all about the coming of the Messiah, and it was all fulfilled by Jesus. So in the process of wanting to reject Jesus, they basically censored, so to speak, half of the Jewish oral tradition, removing the Christological interpretations of the Old Testament that appeared in the Jewish oral tradition, leaving only the legalistic side of things. That's in a nutshell, but I'll, I'll read some passages here. Manasseh ben Israel cites an example of this difference between the spiritual side and the legalistic side. The text of Deuteronomy 6, 8 pres prescribes to wear the tefillin between the eyes. The Talmud explains that the tefillin are phylacteries. It teaches in detail how they must be made, the manner of constructing them, and finally the precise placement on the precise spot on the head where they have to be placed. If the least of these things is not observed, one has not satisfied the obligation of the law. Here, the mission of the Talmud, the inner meaning of the law, has been cast aside in favor of the, of the external structure of the law. It is, it is the, or, the other side of the oral tradition took on the responsibility of explaining the mystical intention of the phylacteries in each of its components. We cite particularly the letter chin that the phylactery carries on in relief under two forms on the head phylactery. Uh, in one place with three points and in the other place with four points. Here is the four-pointed one, there's the four-pointed one on the man's head, and there's the three-pointed one on the other side. We have already seen in volume one, unfortunately I don't have volume one, that according to this um, oral tradition that has not been passed on, the oral tradition that's been censored away, the oral tradition of the prophetic meaning of these things, the three-pointed shin represents the mystery of the thrice holy trinity and the second form the same form with the fourth branch represents the incarnation of the uh, second person of the most holy trinity into man the hypostatic union between the humanity of jesus and the divinity of jesus so that hypostatic union has kind of introduced a fourth branch to the shin and in fact, in this way, the phylacteries were truly the summary of the entire religion of God and of the subsequent redemption by God. Pretty neat, huh? Continuing. The doctors of the synagogue teach with a single voice that the hidden meaning of scripture was revealed on Sinai to Moses, who uh, relayed this knowledge to Joshua and his other intimate disciples. And this secret teaching was transmitted from then on orally from generation to generation without being permitted to be put in writing. That's clear in the Talmud. It's not allowed to put it in writing. They put it in writing. That's another story. According to St. Luke, our Lord approached the doctors of the law that they stripped from the people the key of knowledge that they deprived the people of the key of knowledge a great number of the fathers of the church and of commentators explain that the guilt of these doc of these perfidious doctors consisted that they hid from the people the traditional explanation of the holy books 
the exposition with which they could have recognized the Messiah in the adorable person of Jesus Christ. Because, according to what we just said, from the moment that the gospel was preached, the mysterious, inter the mysterious and prophetic interpretation of the scriptures, which had for their sole object the work of redemption, that means through Jesus, instead of remaining as before in the ancient teaching, was concentrated into a small circle of, initiate, of initiates who were to bring its knowledge through to all ages and all conditions. But, but it wasn't, it was hidden instead. Here we must remark on the character which distinguishes essentially the ancient law from the new law. The ancient law had a secret teaching that one hid from the common people, but which had to be taught openly at the coming of the Messiah. We have already shown what was the object of this teaching. Under the regime of the second, that is this, the, um, the new law, the Christianity, the new covenant, the least of the faithful is initiated into the most sublime truths of religion. And Therefore, a child who knows its catechism has nothing to be jealous of, of the most of the deepest theologians. The Gospels and the doctors of the Church together form the, a single Christian dogma. But the Talmudists, I'll say, in repeating the tradition of certain points of the same dogma, in, envelop it on purpose in an obscure language using ways of speaking that are unknown to the common people and even in common among the doctors. Only the elite had the key of these mysteries. Okay, so there you have it all in a nutshell. Okay, that, that, that Judaism by design, so to speak, had a secret, had a teaching that was to be open to everybody and a prophetic inner meaning to the scriptures, which was to be only passed down orally because it was talking about the Messiah to come and that it was a mystery that was not yet to be revealed. It was only to be revealed when the Messiah came. When the Messiah came, this secret teaching was supposed to be all of a sudden thrown open to everybody so that they could recognize the Messiah. But um, it was kept, it was not only kept secret among the elite, but it was even obfuscated, you know, kind of clouded over, made it impossible to understand by the elite in their uh, essentially resistance, in their wanting to keep secret the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. And so, um, basically, from the days of Moses on, when the Jews, you know, made these to fill in and had them on their head, that three-armed shin and the four-armed shin was a coded message for the, essentially, the relationship between God and humanity in the, as the triune God, the God of creation. And the relationship between God and humanity um, as the God of redemption when the uh, second person, the most holy trinity, would take on a human nature also and make the fourth shin. Pretty darn neat, no? So let me go back to the pictures. Now, um, let's see. Okay, so this, this is basically the picture that you had. Now, what's this got to do with Leonard Nimoy and the Vulcan greeting? Um, first of all, I guess I'll show you the, um, there, that's a beautiful mosaic from a synagogue, I believe in, and that is a emblem of the priestly blessing that on Yom Kippur, the Kohanim, the priests would bless the congregation with their arms somewhat hidden under their tall, under their talus, you know, the prayer shawl, but they would bless it with their hands in this form. This form is, guess what? It's the three-pointed shin. 
is that letter, that SH letter, in three points, right? See that? It's there. So, so, um, so you see that, 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 that hand gesture is a representative representation representation of that. However, once the Messiah came, that three pointed shin should make turn into a four pointed shin, right? Remember that? Let me pull up the four pointed shin. There, there is the four pointed shin. So the three pointed shin should turn into a four pointed shin, like that. Well, let me show you a picture a icon of the Blessed Virgin Mary that is thought to have been pointed, uh, painted by Saint Luke. Uh, no joke. It's in the um, Church of Saint Mark in Jerusalem. The Mar is Maronite Church. Look at Mary's hands. What are Mary's hands? Mary's hands are a four-pointed. Uh, how can I do this? There are four-pointed shin. It's like this, right? So it's the shin with four points, because the Messiah came, because she's holding the Messiah, and she's holding the Messiah with a four-pointed shin. Is that cool or is that cool? Is that cool or is that cool? So it's like she's doing the priest, priestly blessing, which was a reference to the transformation between the Most Holy Trinity and the Most Holy Trinity with the human nature conjoined through the second person of the Most Holy Trinity. Whoops. Oh, I didn't show you the... Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't pull this up. You just think I'm a nut or making this up. There is the icon from uh, painted by St. Luke. And there is the icon with, um, as I was trying to show you before, with the Blessed Virgin Mary with her hands in the priestly blessing form of the four-pointed shin. The four-pointed shin. The, the God after the Incarnation. Now you see her image. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Anyway, that's it. That's super cool. And that's where the, the Star Trek reading comes. I, now, of course, um, Leonard Nimoy <laughs> was, was a uh, Orthodox Jew, or his family was certainly Orthodox Jewish. And so he was still into the three-pointed chin. So he, he, went, he made the Vulcan greeting, and I'll play a little clip of him. He made the Vulcan greeting. I, 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 am, I, am I doing this here? He made the Vulcan greeting as the three-pointed chin because he didn't know about the fourth point, the incarnation. And let me play a little clip of him. Um, you may not know where it came from. This is the shape of the letter Shin, Hebrew alphabet Shin. Very interesting letter in the, in the uh, language. It, it's the first letter in the word Shaddai, the first letter in the word Shalom, first letter in the word Shekhinah which is the name of the feminine aspect of God. The son of Orthodox Jews first saw the gesture while sneaking a peek at a blessing. And I saw them with their hands stuck out from beneath their tallit like this towards the congregation. I thought, wow. Okay, so that's that's where um, that's where he got his um, Vulcan greeting from. Bring this up so that you can see it again. You can compare the pre-incarnation and the post-incarnation Vulcan greeting there. You know the the pre-incarnation and the post-incarnation Shin. This is the painting as it appears in the monastery of Saint Mark in Jerusalem. By the way, I was there in February, and uh, Harpa Day sang a concert there. I think I played some of that concert for you. That's actually, you know what? Mm, I don't know if I can find it quickly enough, but I should play that for you. Anyway, it was sung in, in that monastery. There you, have, there you have the Blessed Virgin Mary with that finger gesture, and there you have the tefillin on the soldier's forehead with the four-fingered chin. Okay, now I'll, now I'll, 
see if NET wakes me up and see what the chaos means does. Uh, and bounded them as a sign on their hand. Yeah, that makes sense. Who were the first three shins? The first three shins were the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune nature of God. The fourth is the hypostatic union. It's it's the it is the entry of human nature into the most holy trinity through the hypostatic union of Jesus. Good questions, Antonia. Three is the Trinity. The fourth is the Trinity with the hypostatic union. These things are I mean that's why this stuff one one reason this stuff was hidden until the coming of the messiahs because no one would understand it i know i mean it took a great deal of theological depth to understand the meaning the symbolic meaning so it wouldn't have done any good to tell somebody before jesus came that the uh that it's one god in three persons but that three persons is going to uh, also combine with the human with human nature, right? It wouldn't have made any sense. So uh, that's probably all.
yet one more for that the demons should go from this land and this horrible world. Because they are wicked. It's from St. Benedict the Prayer. <laughs> One of the uh, sharp-eyed viewers pointed out that I think that is the icon of the Blessed Virgin Mary that's kind of center screen there over the heads of the harpists. Anyway, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. That was fun. So, oh, there I am. I came back all at once. And uh, uh, now I will go back to the opening screen. Oh, wait a minute, but I'll play, uh, um, I won't go back to the opening screen. What a waste of time. I should, I should give you one more. I'll, I'll go out by playing one more of those, um, chants from the, from the cathedral. So I'm just picking it at random. So I don't know what it's going to be, but let's see what it is. Whoops. <laughs> 